All right. So, yeah, this is a, um, a filler shear, so to speak, uh, within Kiddushin, because we knew there wasn't going to be time to do proper hachana this week. Um, so, since I spoke on prenuptial agreements um, at that uh, Malava Malka not that long ago, and wanted a chance to see some of the sources in greater depth than you can do at a Malava Malka shear, um, this is a good opportunity to do it. Um, it may be self-contained this week. It may, you know lead into next week because I have a habit of doing that. Um, I gave you on the first source, or above the first source, a link to the shear from the Malava Malka, which had certain components we're not going to get into. There I talked a little bit about uh, a newer Israeli prenup called Heskem Lekavod Hadadi. Um, I also dealt very briefly with some of the unique Canadian issues. That's not what I plan to discuss here. Um, fundamentally, we're dealing with a very painful problem. Um, you're pitting two major drives against each other. Um, one, the ability of a woman to remarry. Um, it's true that sometimes there's an issue of a man being unable to remarry because the woman is refusing to receive the get. Um, but it's most often what we're talking about is the, uh, the woman's freedom to remarry. There are certain avenues by which a man might be able to, to remarry even if she doesn't receive the get. We don't have the alternative the other way. Um, and then on the other hand, fear of declaring a woman free to marry when she is in fact a married woman. She's an Aisha's Ish. Um, where even if I think, let's say I am, well, pretend I am the, uh, the post-ac answering on this particular case, even if I think it's fine for her to get married, and I don't think it's a Yoharik Valyavor for her to remarry, um, somebody in the future may label her kids Manzerim from that next marriage. Um, and so there's a, there's a fear of harming her by preventing her from being able to remarry. There's a fear of harming her children um, and her and her future husband by, by having her remarry inappropriately. So that, that's the mess that we're, that we're dealing with, a very painful situation and that we're trying to avoid with a prenuptial agreement. So the fundamental problem that we face is the ability of either member of a couple to decline to decline a get. Mid um, the the rule is that a man's that, that the man gives the woman the get and he has to give it willingly or it's not valid. I brought you the Rambam who sums it up very neatly in source number one. The only way a woman can be divorced is via a text that arrives to her. We call that a get, even though, as we know, the original meaning of get was simply a shtar. It was a legal document. There are all sorts of, of uh, you know, get shichur and the like. Nonetheless, colloquially, when you say get, everybody knows what you mean. And he says there are ten essentials to divorce. And here they are, the first one on the list. That a man only divorces willingly. And it's by text. It can't be by, uh, by speech. I just, you know, you say by text today. It means something different. I don't mean by texting. I mean that it has to be a written document on, on material. The... Um, the, the Rambam in the next Halacha writes, How do you know that these are, in fact, biblical requirements? And he addresses the first one. The Pasuk says that if there is this falling out, the discussion of grounds for divorce is a fascinating one, but not for right now. The, um, he writes for her a Sefer Christus, and he gives it to her, puts it in her hand, and sends her away because that was usually the way things worked, was that he was the one who, uh, who remained in the, uh, in the home. That, whether that's a core requirement is a separate discussion. It, but the, the point here goes back to the beginning of the Pasuk. Im lo sim be'inav. Right? It implies, not implies, it explies, it says explicitly, that he has decided that he doesn't want to remain married to her. So he has to actually have made such a decision. And if it's against his will, the divorce is invalid. But biblically, she can be divorced with her will or without her will. Technically, she does not need to, to agree to receive it. Right? Remember the way that that marriage works on a simple straightforward level he accepts a degree of financial responsibility for her the, um, and the, the assumption biblically is that if she is refusing to receive the get that means he persists in all these requirements that come with the ksuba that's not appropriate the, uh, why should she be able to hold him to, uh, to all of these requirements therefore he can divorce her without her, uh, without her agreement midi 
it's not so. Meet the Rabbanan, the man cannot give a get to a woman unless she agrees to receive it. This was already a problem, meaning the man's sole ability, the man's unique ability to divorce her um, and the power it gave him over her and over the marriage was already a problem in the days of the Mishnah and the Gemara. This is not a new issue. Anyone who's learned the fourth parak of Gittin remembers the discussion about this terrible man who sends a get to his wife with a shaliach via a proxy. Proxy leaves, and then afterwards the man goes to a based in and he cancels the get without the shaliach even being present. So at that point, any once there's such power, then any woman who receives a get via proxy is going to be worried. Maybe my husband canceled it. She's not going to know. Can she get remarried? Can she not get remarried? He shows up uh, five years later and says, actually, the get was no good. The, um, so, you know, at that point, the Mishnah there says, Rebbe made a takana, he made a rule, that, in fact, you're not able to, uh, to cancel the get in that, uh, in that way. He, he disqualified such an act of bitul, but that tells you there was such a concern, right? The Gemara in the first parak in Ksuvos has the problem of a man who gives a conditional get and doesn't fulfill the condition, right? He says, "This is a get if I don't show up in a year." Right? And then he doesn't show up. And he claims afterwards that the reason he didn't show up was Ones. He became deathly ill. He wasn't able to, uh, to make it. There was a flood or whatever it was. And so the Rabbanon created a rule. Ain Ones begin. You can't claim Ones. He can't say, well, I was kept for, due to forces beyond my control. It doesn't make a difference. The, um, so, the, so you saw there already a concern for the problems that come with this uh, ability of the man to potentially cancel the get and the requirement that the get comes from him. And you saw that the Rabbanan actually took steps to, to avoid the problem in different ways. But all their, their, their solutions were not, let's overturn the entire system. Let's create a way in which she can divorce. That's not what they did. What they did was, piece by piece, case by case, they said, here's a Takana to solve this, here's a Takana to solve that. Of course, there was an overarching option, right? The, uh, the overarching option was, Kofan Osho Oso Adshi Rotsani. Let's compel him to give the get willingly. They, uh, sometimes people need a little help in order to give a get willingly. So the Rambam writes... Source number two, based on the Gemara, Misha did no sin shekofen oso legarish is ishto v'loratzo legarish. If halachically the man should divorce, we're going to come back to that phrase in a moment. But if halachically man, the man is obligated to divorce his wife, such that we would compel him because it is his mitzvah, we force people to fulfill their mitzvahs under certain circumstances, and he is refusing. Based in Shal Yisrael, b'chomakum b'cholzman, makin oso at shomarotzani. So a based in wherever, whenever, can hit him until he says, yeah, I want to. And then he writes, the guy will get kosher, and guess what? That works. The, uh, remember, the view of the Rambam in uh, Mitzvah Sasei Reish Chafez, the view of Zifra Chinuch in Mitzvah Tav Kufayintas, is that giving a get is a mitzvah. Unclear exactly how that mitzvah operates. The, um, but uh, but the, therefore, you are able to compel him to do the mitzvah. The Rambam believes this includes physical force, right? as you just saw. Um, other posts can disagree on applying this in all cases. I brought you the Shach here in Gvuras Anashim in source number three, who, who talks about the man who will not live with his wife. He says, "Ola mi kol zeshkasavdi da filu b'monei ami mena kol inyane ishus ein lachof b'shotim ella b'ba machmas taina." He says, "What emerges from his discussion is that even if the man will not be with his wife in a whole variety of ways, we don't hit him. Lachof b'shotim is to hit him with sticks. The ella b'ba machmas taina, unless she comes to him with a particular." claim, the, um, and what we're talking about here is the claim that he doesn't sleep with her. That's what we're talking about, Tashmish. The, uh, and there he says, then yes, the, um, then, we would, uh, then we would hit him. But there are circumstances where physical force may be used, but the key goes back to the opening words of that Rambam in source number two. Mi shahadin no sein shakofin o soligarish. Only if the based in rules that a get is required. It isn't as though in all circumstances you can just say, well, we'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll threaten him and force him and so on. It doesn't work that way. And that's going to be the language in the Shulchan Aruch, which we'll see later in Eben Hezer, Kuflam Dalid. Hey, today, of course, kofin o soligarish is severely limited because of the rule of law and, you know, specifically the crimes of assault and battery and that sort of thing. The, um, so, so that's, you know, that's, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, it's a good story about 
there are stories <laughs> about. <laughs> unfortunately, I, I, I mean, unfortunately, yes, there are. There have been arrests, yeah. the, um, and some of the people I know who were involved should have been arrested and should have been arrested long ago. But that's a whole other discussion. The certainly not one for recordings. So, in any case. Um, there have been attempts made to try to solve this problem by incorporating agreements which would lead to parties not withholding a get. The, uh, generally speaking, these have targeted the male, even though, yes, again, there are cases where women refuse to, uh, to receive gin. This goes back to the period of the Rishonim and post-nuptial attempts to get a man to agree to give a get. I brought you in source number four, Rabbeinu Peretz, writing in 13th century Ashkenaz, the, uh, he talks about, well, you see it. He says, if a man swears that he's going to give a get, so the Beisdin has to do Hatara Zedarim for him beforehand. Otherwise, he can say that he was compelled. But then he says, But a man could give a pledge, a collateral and say, I am giving this to be reclaimed in the event that I give the get. That's a, that's a post-nuptial notes. They're already married. The, um, but there's some, you know, she pushes or somebody else pushes him to give the get, and he says, I'm going to do it, and here is my collateral. That is acceptable, says Rabbi Duperet, and we don't consider the get to be a coerced get, what we call a get ma'usa, even though he had a financial incentive to, uh, to give the get. Second example, same period of time, 13th century, but in Svard, the, uh, the Rashba gives a case. The, uh, take a look at source number five. Reuven Baal Leia, Ukrove Leia, Hayu Bahaskama Shegarish Reuven Zeh Leia Ishto. Reuven is married to Leia, so he and Leia's relatives came to an agreement that he would divorce her. We don't know anything about what brought them to this circumstance, but that's what happened. The Vineosu Zela Zebiknas Elev Dinarim Shigarish Zela's Manyudua. The uh, they agreed to have a fine of a thousand dinar, the uh, and he would divorce her at a certain time, meaning a fine if he fails to do so. Then Reuven says, you know, I don't want to do it. And they're saying, you know, you're going to owe us a thousand dinar. To the point where he's going to the Gizbar. The Gizbar presumably is some person who's holding the money in escrow. And, uh, and is pleading with him to cut a deal. He doesn't want anything to do with the strategies that his wife's uh, relatives established, Adaraba, etc. The uh, well, they're going to force him to go to jail until he pays. And he is going to divorce, not because he wants to divorce, but because he's afraid of being put in jail or having to pay. But he gave the get. And he didn't know enough to give a moda. A moda is a declaration that you give in advance of doing something that you were compelled to do. In other words, you're being forced to perform some rite in Basin, whatever it is, whether it's the get or anything else. You don't want to do it. However, if you say that in Basin, then some bad result is going to happen. So what you do is you go in advance to aid him and you give them a moda. Moda is a declaration of what I'm about to do is something I'm just being forced to do, and that's the only reason I'm doing it. So this guy didn't know enough to do that. So in Nidon Gezek, he didn't get Meusa in Lav, so the Rashba's question is, is that a get Meusa? Is that considered a coerced get? Because he did it in order to avoid a financial penalty. Without yet going into the Rashba's ruling, the point is that this simply shows you what was going on in terms of trying to get the man to agree to follow through, I should say, on a get. And one more case, which is very, very important, involving Rabbi Maimon Nuar, who honestly I do not come across at all other than in this one halacha. Kasavar of Maimon Nuar. Shanishal al Ruven Shakanas Asma Bameya Zahuvim La Adon Hayir. Rabbi Maimon Nuar wrote, he was asked the following question. The question, um, I've seen it suggested, actually came from the, uh, the Me'iri. The uh, the because uh, the question that's put to him is from Rabbi Menachem of I'm blanking now not Provence um, 
was it Port Pinyon? I don't know. It was Menachem, Menachem from a place where we think the Meiri was. They, uh, and it's at the right time for it to be, uh, for it to be the Meiri. So that's, that's what's been suggested. But anyway, Rav Maimon was asked, Reuven shekanas ansma b'meyaz ahuvim la'adon ha'ir. Reuven agreed to a fine against himself. He will give a hundred gold coins to the mayor. And basically the, uh, the case is if he, if he doesn't divorce his wife, he's gonna, he's gonna have to pay this fine and he divorced her. And Rav Maimon accepted it. And the Shulchan Aruch and Eba Ezer discusses the validity of these and other cases where the husband commits to something which provides a disincentive for failure to give a get. Okay. So far so good? Bless you. So, so this is not a new problem. Um, but you fast forward to the 20th century and you get these formal prenuptial agreements that attempt to solve the problem in advance of there being a situation, not where Reuven and Leah had a falling out or Reuven and Leah's relatives had a falling out. The, um, but, uh, but to do it before the marriage even begins. So in the 1950s, the conservative movement tries to amend the Ksuba with what becomes known as the Lieberman Clause. Today it's still available. They call it the conservative Ksuba. Uh, American Orthodoxy rejected tampering with the Ksuba and preferred to have separate documents that were raised before the marriage. Um, over the decades, ideas that brought forth Rabbi Tzahol Jolti, the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim, Rabbi Shalom Ashash, the chief rabbi of Morocco, who um, also at the one point was the Sephardic chief rabbi of the, uh, the state of Israel, um, they support approaches which involve a financial payment from him to her in the event that they're living apart and he doesn't divorce her. And it, I'm sorry, no, that's not what they required. They said they talked about a financial payment from him to her, where halacha requires that he give a get, and he fails to do so. In other words, the most narrow of cases, the Rambam's Kofin case. They, um, that was what, what they wrote about. In the early 1990s, Rav Mordechai Willig and the RCA build on an article in Moria by Diane C. Gardner and Rav Zaman Achemia Goldberg, and they come up with the first Rabbinical Council of America prenuptial agreement meant to operate in the USA, providing both a financial payment and a binding arbitration agreement. Binding arbitration agreement says that they commit that if, whatever, if there's, you know, getting towards divorce, there are, in certain circumstances, they'll deal with a particular bait din to resolve their divorce-related issues which doesn't only mean the get, but it can mean custody, it can mean yeah, all sorts of other issues. Um, in 2004, uh, Tonet Rabbanit Rachel Levmore, along with Rabbi Yashiv Noel and Rabbi Dr. David Ben Sasson, come up with the agreement I mentioned before, the Heskem Lechvot Hadadi, which we're not discussing um, in, this, uh, you know, in this year, but that's for use in Israel. Uh, Tzohar adopts a version of it. And then there's a whole other agreement called the Tripartite Agreement, which is even newer. But that's radically different from everything that we're going to talk about. That involves Kiddushin al Tanai, uh, Takanos Kahal, um, there's discussion of Hafkaz Kiddushin, of nullifying mar- marriage retroactively. None of that is involved in the sort of standard prenuptial agreement. It's fascinating. If you want to see more, there are a bunch of articles on it in the 37th volume of Truman. That was last year's uh, issue, last year's volume. So there, there, there are quite a few articles on it. It's fascinating stuff. Okay. So the classic RCA agreement is the one we're talking about here. It's a good case for analyzing the major issues surrounding the standard prenuptial agreement. So there are two parts, as I said. First of all, you have the binding arbitration agreement. Take a look at source number seven, please, which has the text. You can look at their website, theprenup.org. Arbitration. Should a dispute arise between the parties so that they do not live together as husband and wife, they agree to submit to binding arbitration before the Bethlehem of America, which shall have exclusive jurisdiction to decide all issues relating to a get, suba, tnoim, entered into by the husband to be and the wife to be, any issues and obligations arising from or in connection with this agreement, any disputes relating to the enforceability, formation, conscionability, and validity of this agreement, and the arbitrability, which I didn't know was a word, of any disputes arising here under. That's the arbitration agreement. Now, the uh, the version that was in use when I was involved in uh, in officiating at weddings, you could choose which issues you wanted to you know you could check off which issues you wanted to have them deal with, and you could identify your own based in. The point was not to say people are going to have to go to the RCA. The point was to say that they agree in advance what the venue is going to be for dealing with their problems, because that in and of itself is often where things get stuck. 
Because each one says, I'm going to get a better deal if we go to mine. So they each refuse, naturally, to go to the other ones. So this was meant to, sur- to surmount that hurdle. And if you flip ahead for a second to source number eight, you find this is not a problem. This isn't where any controversy is about prenuptial agreements, the, um, as you see from Ramosha's Chuva. He was asked about adding text to the time. If God forbid they would come to separate after they've gotten married, the husband will not refuse to give a get, the woman will not refuse to accept it. When such and such a based in agrees. That, uh, oh, not agrees, instructs that it be done. They don't mention here discussion about custody or anything else. It's simply that they're going to agree to go by whatever X based in says. And because that's been added to the Tanaim, secular courts are going to force them to listen to the based in. So that's the question. Are you allowed to do that? Is it a secular court issue? So Ramosha's answer is Hasafas davar zemutar, vaget lo yegema Hundred percent fine. It is not considered a coerced to get. And it would be great to save her from being an aguna. Then he adds the note of sensitivity that gets brought up when you discuss uh, prenuptial agreements, which is, you know, it's not necessarily healthy for a relationship. You, know, you have to be very careful about how you bring this up. So he says, He says you have to know who you're dealing with and know whether introducing this could actually cause problems for them. Okay. That's the, um, that's the, that's the, the binding arbitration agreement. That's relatively straightforward. The financial payment is the, uh, is where things get harder. The financial payment says in the event that, well, you don't even need to tell you. Go back to source number seven. Why am I, uh, summarize? Support obligation. Husband to be acknowledges that he recites and accepts the following. I obligate myself. He wanted to be his verbal declaration. So the document says that he acknowledges in the document that he has recited this. I obligate myself to support my wife to be according to the requirements of Jewish law governing Jewish husbands. Mizonos. Furthermore, I hereby now, me'achshav, we're going to come back to the importance of that word, obligate myself in a manner that I cannot exempt myself with any claim of ashmachta or any other claim to support my wife to be from the date that our domestic residence together shall cease for whatever reasons at the rate of $150 per day dot 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 calculated and so on um, the idea that it's not asmachta remember what asmachta is right asmachta is an agreement that someone makes because he believes he's never going to be forced to actually honor his, uh, his commitment either because he believes the circumstances will never come to pass or he believes he'll never be held to it so he says I am not going to claim later on that I never expected to have to pay this in lieu of my Jewish obligation of support and he says this, this agreement of 150 per day is in lieu of Mizonos we have to talk about that also as here and above cited and circumscribed so long as the two of us remain married according to Jewish law even if she has another source of income or earnings that's also an important clause that we have to come back to Furthermore, I waive my halachic rights to my wife's earnings for the period that she is entitled to the above stimulated sum, also an important point, and I recite that I shall be deemed to have repeated this waiver at the time of our wedding, right, part of making sure he can't claim he backed out of it. I acknowledge that I have now may achshav have effected the above obligation by means of a kinyan in an esteemed based in, a based in chashav, also important points that we have to explain. However, this support obligation shall terminate if, despite husband-to-be's compliance with the terms of this agreement and the decision or recommendation of the Basin of America, wife-to-be refuses to appear upon due notice. If she's the one holding out, then you can't force him to pay $150 a day. Furthermore, wife-to-be waives her right to collect any portion of this support agreement attributable to the period preceding the date of her reasonable attempt to provide written notification to husband-to-be that she intends to collect the above sum. So, in other words, they're not living together. And he thinks it's just mutual separation. And then she comes to him six months later and says, here's a bill for what you've owed me. That's no good. He has to know that this is now being triggered. Said written notification must include wife to be's notarized signature. The support obligation under Jewish law, independent of any civil or state law obligation for spousal support, dot, dot, dot. Okay.
that is the uh, that is the agreement with, as we said, a lot that we have to discuss. So there are two basic ways that this payment is presented, and each one has its advantages and its pitfalls. The first way to present it, and they try sort of to do it this way in here, is to say it's Mizonos. Mizonos, you have a chiyuv of support. The, the chiyuv of support is going to be $150 per day. That's what we're stipulating. It's different from standard Mizonos because you are stipulating a sum. Right? Normally, Mizonos just means, okay, I'll foot the bill for whatever food costs us and whatever rent costs us, and you know that's my, uh, that's my support obligation. The, um, here, you're actually stipulating a sum, and you're going to apply it even when they are living apart. That also is a big deal. It's modeled on Rabbeinu Peretz. Right? Rabbeinu Peretz had his collateral that he's going to, to present so long as he has not um, provided it yet. That's what this is modeled on. And take a look at your sheet. It's source number 9, where the Shulchan Aruch brings it. Im liten get kodem. Right? This is like Rabbeinu Peretz explicitly. Right? He swore to, uh, to give a get. Then you do a taras and darim first before he gives the get, because you don't want it to look like ones. Look like Ones. Ah, Arvus Yitain, but he can give a collateral, he can give a pledge in Yirtz. Shein is a Domela Ones. Because that's not like Ones. The fact that there is a financial incentive does not turn this into Ones. That's the, um, that's the key for us. The Rama continues, and we're going to see a lot of this Rama. Um, the same thing is true if, he's quoting the Chumas the, um, if he has a formal Kenyan. I am going to divorce. Avo, in kibbal of knasos in lo yigarish lo mikriones. The but in contradistinction from the shavua, from the oath case, if he accepts a fine for failure to divorce, that's not called ones. Me achar de talu gito bedavar achir. The um, I'm sorry. So you know what? I'm sorry. I have to go back to Jumas Adeshin for a second. If he accepted Kenyan legarish, then we want there to be a, uh, a nullification of it before the divorce, let it not be called ones. But if he accepted a fine, that's not called ones. Why? Because it's indirect. Because he has linked the get to something external. He could just as easily pay the fine. And then not divorce. In other words, we're distinguishing between where there's a direct line of coercion. He said, I'm going to do it, and now he is stuck. He swore to do it, and now he is stuck. And either he's going to give the get, or not give the get. Whereas in, in this circumstance, he just said, I owe you a bunch of money, which I can get out of by giving you a get. But that's your choice. It's indirect. Sorry, is what you going to say? I was just going to say, how, how indirect is it? If it's prohibitive, you could make that argument. So the argument here, at least, is that not, because he hasn't given a ceiling. He simply said, you could pay the knossos. Right. Yeah. V'yesh machmirin, then he goes on to say, V'yesh machmirin, afilu b'kiyai gavna. The, um, he says, not so fast. The, there are those who are indeed strict and say no, that we accepted the knas, now we have a problem. V'tov lachosh l'chathchilu l'potro minak knas. What you really should do is, before he gives the get, exempt him from the knas. Say, you don't have to pay this money. And assuming he doesn't then run off, you're fine. He then goes and goes in and gives the get without the knas hanging over him. Aval in pragirish mipnezef, but once he has already divorced with the knas hanging over his head, vafilu girish mikach shvuah shasam e atzmo legarish or the shvuah case that Rabbeinu Peretz mentioned, haget kasher b'diyeva. This is fine. Ha'olu mitchilu lo ansu hu akach because the bottom line is he wasn't forced to take the Shavua in the first place. You have a similar idea, the Nachla Shiva, his 23rd form, he talks about uh, a shtar to guarantee he'll do chalitza, the base mayor, Evan Ezer, Kuf Samachayev, held such an agreement. That's, the, um, that's one way to look at it, is simply, here is a Mizonos payment. Um, the advantage of this, of structuring it as just a continuation of Mizonos, is that it's not Asmachta. Asmachta, Right? Is again, the claim that I never really expect I was going to do this. What do you mean? You've been paying this for years. You've been paying Mazonas for years. This is just a continuation of it. You started when you got married. And it's not called coercion, says the Chazanish, because we don't call it coercion when you have basic obligations that are related to the marriage. 
meaning your obligation of Bizonos you've had since day one. Take a look at source number 10. He says, Umaydin Estaya, the support for his point, the, um, that, that it is considered knas in the case that he's discussing, as I, I added the bracketed words. The, the, the person who had written that there is a concern for knas, Mish'er Ksus, Lav Raya, the Hasan Bekafu Bishoti, he says the case of somebody who doesn't want to divorce his wife and he's forced to by being beaten is not analogous to the case of somebody who is forced in the sense that he has Sherxus and Ona and uh, he doesn't want to meet those. He doesn't want to pay for, for her clothing. He doesn't want to pay for her food. He's going to divorce her in order to avoid that and then he's going to claim, well, that was Ones. I was coerced because there's this big sum of money that I keep having to pay. That doesn't work. Vanda la Ones. And the same thing is true when it comes to exemption from the knas. So, so it's not asmachta and it's not ma'usa. So it sounds really good. Just call it mizonos and call it a day. Um, however, there are problems. One problem is that technically there's no obligation for mizonos if they're not living together. That, that obligation doesn't exist. The, um, so that's one problem to which the response is that that's only if the reason they're not living together is her fault if the reason they're not living together is his fault it's not so if you think of the Gemara at the beginning of Ksuvos which we're going to come back to a little bit later which talks about how they were supposed to get married within a year of when they did the Kiddushin and in the event that they didn't he was going to have to start supporting her Right? And then there's a discussion. Well, why aren't they living together? Is it because she was Anita? Is it because he was sick? Right? The, um, that's, the, that's the question. But here, it's not her fault. And indeed, if she is inappropriately causing them to live apart, then she will have no claim to the sum. We saw that in the, uh, in the document. But you now know why it said in the document, the, um, we said... Where was it? In the support obligation. We had a note about it, even, there, even though they're no longer living together, didn't we? I thought it was there, too. I'm not seeing it right now, but that's because I'm rushing through it. Okay, fine. The, um, we certainly had the, uh, the clause saying, unless this is uh, her fault. The, From the date that our domestic residents together shall cease. No, but the idea that he has to pay this as Mizonos, even though they're living apart. That's what I was looking for. I mean, it says he obligates himself to support my wife from the day that our domestic residence. Right, no, that's the... That's not enough. Right, no, I was looking for something else. The, um, I was looking for something else. It's okay. The, the second problem is that if he provides Mizonos, so generally that means he's also entitled to her income. The, um, he's supposed to be able to get, uh, to get her income as a, you know, in, uh, in exchange. So, there are a couple of answers to this. One, via the Chalakas Machokek, quoting the Bach. If you take a look at source number 11, the Shulchan Aruch Eben Ezer, right, Simon Pei, talks about the husband's rights to the wife's income. The, the right that a man has, that in the event that he is supporting his wife, he is entitled to her income, is only limited to a certain baseline income that he has a right to expect that she's going to bring into the marriage. If she works extra hours or makes extra efforts, and therefore she is able to transcend that basic income number, the um Hamosar Labal, whatever she makes that is over the regular sum, husband gets that too, says the Shulchan Aruch. The uh, take a look at the Chagas Machokek in number 12, commenting on that line. Va'ayim betur, hevi deos bazem, machlokas rebenu tam verav hai verav hai. He says the tour brings a machlokas on this, rebenu tam on one side, of hai going on the other. Va'arosh lo hechria. The rush did not determine who was the winner. And the woman is able to say, I follow the view that says I keep the extra. Right? Kimli is a basic pretenant of uh, Chosh and Mishpat that as long as there's a reasonable view that you could say that was the one you were following when you entered the agreement, then, uh, then, then that will have to be honored. The Kasav Harav the Bach, 
Shekein noagim b'medinos elu shalo lahutzim yada isha shum ha'adafa shaydeyat chak. The Bach's position is that that is indeed our practice. Anything she earns that um, that is over and above, that is um, that is hers. She gets to uh, she gets to to keep it, and the general approach is that what women make today is considered to be over and above. The um, that's the way that they well, that they look at it they today. Obviously, there has to be some sort of baseline sum. Right. So that's what I would have thought, but no one even like walks into trying to make that kind of assessment. They just say that whatever they make today is considered to be over and above. I don't know why. Above what? I, I, yeah, yeah I, I, I understand the problem. I mean, the stronger argument, honestly, is not that one. The stronger argument is the second one, in source number 13, from Mevanezek's Simen Samach Tess, which says, If the man, before the marriage, makes a stipulation, he says, I will not be obligated in one of the things I am responsible for under the, uh, under the Ksuba, or the woman makes a condition that he doesn't have a right to whatever it is. That's binding. Except for three things. Ona. He's not allowed to make a condition that he that he's not going to uh, to fulfill Ona. Iker Ksubasa, not Tosefas, but the basic Suba obligation that he's going to pay her a certain amount, or the, his estate will pay a certain amount in the event of his death or of divorce. And Tirushasa, the, uh, the ability that he has to inherit from her. The, um, the two things from him to her, one thing from her to him, you're not able to forfeit. But the, uh, but the others... Make a condition and that's it. So that, just, just give me one second, that was the language in the prenup, where the, uh, where the, the document back in source number seven said, the um, first line, oh, on the second page, the, the, um, the, the bottom of the right, the bottom of the the bottom of the previous one. Furthermore, I waive my halachic rights and wife's earnings for the period that she is entitled to the above stipulated sum. That's the uh, it's the top of the second on yours. Are you using the word that they put in? Yeah, that's why. Okay, yeah. So it's the bottom line on the first side is what you uh, is what you want. That's the danger of sending it out in word form for people who don't work. The um, but that's the statement. Okay. It was there originally. Okay. So now, what were you going to say before, Ezra? I was going to ask, would this have to be stipulated? But I see it is here anyway. Yes. So that's the um, that's the that's the way you get around this problem of her um, the problem of her claiming the Mizonos and yet not giving him the uh, the income. So this is all one formulation. It's this is Mizonos. The second formulation is that this is a payment like damages, essentially, because he is keeping her from marrying somebody else and getting support there. What we call Mizonos Mizonos Interesting. I wrote something here in my notes, but it's not right, so I'm not sure what I wrote. The, uh, I think what I meant to write was um, I think is what I intended to write in my notes, but I have a typo in it. doesn't matter. The point is not that. The point is not my notes. The point is the Gemara Bach Mitziah. Source 14. Alex, were you going to say something before? Did I stop you? Okay. Number 14. Gemara Bach Mitziah, you base him at base. Talking about a man's right to Mitzias Ishto, to that which his wife finds, and the statement that had been made prior to the start of our Gemara, that uh, in the event that he divorces her, he has no claim to her found objects. So the Gemara says, I knew that. Girsha um, Pshita. Hachamayaskina. No, you know what our case is. Bimigureshes ve'eno migureshes. A woman who is divorced but not divorced. What does that mean? Damar Bizer Mishmuel. Whenever the Chachamim say she is in this category of divorced but not divorced, the husband has an obligation to support her. And I would have thought, therefore, that he would also be entitled to things that she finds. But why is it that the husband has a right to whatever she finds? To prevent enmity. Right? That's normally why. The husband is supporting her. She finds a million dollars, right? A lottery ticket worth a million dollars, and he says, hey, that's something you found. I should be able to get some of that. After all, I've been supporting you. 
the, um, there will be enmity in the event that they don't share that. But Hacha, but here, where she is this in-between state, she's divorced, but not fully divorced, the um, Islaim of Eva, there's already enmity. And that's fine. Let there be more enmity. We want them to, to complete the divorce. What we're talking about here is where he is keeping her from marrying somebody else. That's what we mean. I didn't bring Urashi in the Gemara. But that's what we mean when we say Megureshes, Veinu Megureshes. The, um, and so the, the idea here is that he is obligated in Mizonos. I'm sorry, no, well, he's obligated to support her, but it's not really viewed as Mizonos. As Rebetal Jolti explained, it's more like a Knas. If you take a look at source number 15, Rezolti's formulation, he says, commenting on the Shita Mekubetzes on that Gemara, who bear Dvarav of the Shita Mekubetzes, for some reason they didn't bring the Shita, I don't remember why, the, um, he says, he says the fact that in such a case the man has to give Mizonos is not because we don't know what her status is and therefore since we're in doubt keep on paying her it is a brand new obligation of Mizonos because she is bound to him that's the uh, that's the idea. This is um, this is not Mizonos. It's a separate payment because you're keeping her from marrying somebody else and getting Mizonos elsewhere. Tommy, I assume here they're living separate and apart. They are living separate. Yeah. Separate, not Skype, Correct. Mizonos. Now we say yes. Right. Well, the thing is this. Um, Rav Amar, Rav Shlomo Amar wrote on this that Rajolti is concerned he doesn't want this to be regular Mizonos because that will bring limitations like maybe a high of Mizonos if you're not living together so by constructing this as a quasi-fine Right? We don't want to use the word fine. We're, we're afraid of the word fine because that raises the smarter questions. But, um, but essentially that's what it is. It's a separate payment. It's not Mizonos. And that way it can apply even if he's not getting her income. And it'll apply even if they're living apart. So it doesn't have the pitfalls associated with, um, with being Mizonos. That's the idea. Rizzolti also says the husband is able to go to Bastin to ask for a reduction in the amount for this. Rav Amar thinks it's that they'll get, that the basin will be able to discuss the get with him and convince him to give the get. So he wants there to be an interaction with the, uh, with the basin. So what are the advantages here? Well, it doesn't give him rights to her income, right? That's, uh, that's clear. And it, it persists even if um, they're, they're living apart. So that's a good thing. Um, and it applies even if she has a parnasa. Rizzolti sought to prove this um, based on Rashi in Ksuvos, source number 16, it invokes the case of the Gureshes Ve'ena Megureshes, and Rashi there says that case is talking about Minha Erosin, which is a case where there is no normal Mazonos payment. Mazonos don't forget from Erosin, right? So why is there an obligation? Flip the page onto this Shita Mekubetas, source number 17. This time I brought the Shita. Be'esh Makshim, Hechi Matzah the Farish Minha Erosin. They ask, what do you mean? From the Erosin, as Rashi writes, there's no there's no chiyuv mizonos for an arusa, even if she's not in this weird divorce not divorce category. He says that's the point. She is divorced but not divorced, and therefore she is bound to him, and she can't get married. Therefore, he has to support her. And the point is, it exists even if it's from the Arison. And here he quotes you that Gemara from the beginning of Ksuvos. Just like the case where the year has elapsed and they didn't get married, and we say to him, you have to support her. It's not normal Mazonos. That's true. <laughs> Nonetheless, you have to pay it. The pitfalls of this are, number one, if it's a knas, we're more likely to argue asmachta, because he never expected that he was going to actually have to pay it. It's not like it's Mizonos, which you've been paying all along. You lose that advantage of, uh, of Mizonos. Yes and no. What do you mean? Not from the asmachta perspective. It, here you have well, the other it. piece is that it's more likely to claim uh, meusa. That because it's kanas, but it's both. But I mean, you still have this precedent of saying you can be mechayev a mizonos like payment. No, because they'll say we don't expect them to give the get. So don't give a get. Just keep on supporting her. Keep on supporting her with what? With the 
what do you mean? He has whatever food he has, whatever money he has. What do you mean? In other words, this, as far as the Gemara is concerned, this isn't being used as a tool to incite get. This is just okay. Responsibility, of yeah, sort. yeah. But which is not Mizono. No, it's it's a. Right, so, so what do you mean? But you can still be high of the ball. This version of Mizonos. Yes. So what are you saying? And uh, okay. it'll, it will happen to follow that it will also help force a get. It will also help to force a get. Yes. No, that's true. But the question is, can he claim that this was asmachta? Because I never expected that I was going to have such an obligation. You said asmachta of what? To pay her this support. But, I mean... Or non-support. No, the Gemara says that in this case you have to pay the supporter, similar to... No, but the question is, the Gemara is based... Can you make the argument that this... That this case is analogous to... Yeah. ...and Iris and Iris and uh, or no, can you, or can you make the argument that, that um, yeah, dep- it'll depend on the sum that you're going to stipulate? So that... You yeah. Can, correct. Okay. So sure. the more likely view so of this... Argument you can make with classic with Yeah. Um, less so. Because he's been paying it all along. It's not viewed as a... Granted that you never gave us a number before. before. No, but he's been paying with Zonos. And this is just our version of Mizonos. He agreed to pay Mizonos, and it's his problem. The more likely view um, seems to be that it's as Rizzoldi suggested, meaning that it is a payment that he has to make because he's keeping her to, from remarrying. That's the one that, that seems to be more likely. So what do you do about the problems of asmachta and Meusa coercion? So what we do for the asmachta issue is we try to make this more real so to speak. Um, and that's why we had that emphasis in the text, in number seven, on me'achshav, saying that it is from now. Because if you take a look at source number 18 on your sheet, look at the Rambam. In Elchos Mechira, he's not dealing with get there. When the Chacham of Spain wanted there to be a Kenyan involving Asmachta, in other words, you wanted someone to agree to something which you knew you know, he never expected that it's actually going to be a requirement that he's going to follow through. So, this is what they did. They'd make a Kenyan with him on his statement that he owes somebody a hundred dinar. Now that he's created this artificial debt, I owe you a hundred dinar. Um, they would then make a Kenyan with the creditor of this artificial debt they make him say that if your artificial debtor follows through with such and such an action you forgive it from now but if he doesn't do it, if that condition is not fulfilled, then I will make him, uh, I'm going to claim that money from the artificial debt. And that was what we did. So we created an artificial debt, and it's all from now, with a stipulation that it will be forgiven from now if the person fulfills it. But the me'achshav is really important. And that's what the language is that's brought in the Shulchan Aruch. Source 19. Kol ha'omer, kan me'ach k'nei me'achshav. If someone says, acquire this, or the Kenyan is, from now, in kan asmachta klal v'kana, there's no asmachta, and it works. She'il lo gomer la'achnos, lo ikno me'ach, lo ikno me'achshav. The, um, because if he yeah, doesn't intend it, then why would he say the Kenyan is from now? You, you're making it real right now. Kate said, and he goes through the case. Okay. And then the Ramah says, The Ramah says, Not everybody is so happy with Me'achshav, and he's going to go through what we're going to see next. So hold off on what he has next. But the point here is, Me'achshav is a solution. Rabbi Bleich does not like this. Because he says, you're still talking about an open-ended debt. There's no number. It may be 150 per day. But he doesn't know how many days it's going to be. You can't agree to something that could be thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. But he's in control. He, he is in control, but he doesn't know what he has agreed to. That's the problem. It's not a real agreement. You, you can't do that. We talk about this regarding wills. When people want to write a, a halachic will... 
one of the major concerns is, in terms of some of the ways that it's structured is that you end up with an asmachta. It's longer, you know, let me, not, let me not get into that. The bottom line is that when you're agreeing to something where you don't actually know the number, you know, you know a percentage, or you know some, you know, whatever, then, then the, the odds of someone calling asmachta on it are pretty high. Solution number two, which is incorporated here as well, and you see it, I bolded it there in the Shulchan Aruch, in source number 19, is you do the Kenyan in front of a based in Chashuv. An important based in. What is an important based in? So look at the language in the Shulchan Aruch. This is fun. He says, in the Ramah, I should say. The Ramah says, continuing where we left off in 19, we based in Chashuv We want it to be based in Chashuv as well as from now. What is it based in Chashuv? So take a look at Sif Tezvav. It's still in number 19. will have a based in Chashuv kana. It works. Parentheses. What you need are Dayanim who know what a, what Asmachta looks like. Some say that we require that it be the important based in in the city, or people who are recognized as experts. But if you say, write in the document for our Kenyan that we did it in the base in Chashuv, even though that's not true, that works. Because he acknowledged it. What do you want? Even if he didn't say it explicitly, and even if he doesn't say right in it that it was done in a based in chashuv, it's as though he said that. We're good. The uh, So that's that's a second level, and that was again the language that you saw. The, um, in the uh, in the RCA prenup, right? I have now my Aksha affected the above agreement obligation by means of a Kenyan in an esteem based in as prescribed by Jewish law. The, um, and even though he didn't do it in the based in Chashev at all, nonetheless, it's going to be okay. So Rabbi Blech is not a fan of that either because he knows that the Machaber doesn't, doesn't really seem to be in favor of this kind of low level of what constitutes a based in Chashev. These are all Yeshomrim, Yeshomrim, Yeshomrim. And he says the Mechaber doesn't like it, and the husband could always say Kimli. Just like she wanted to say Kimli before, that they, um, you know, in terms of, uh, of rights to her income or whatever, so too, he can say Kimli, I follow the view that you knew you need a real base in Chashuv in order for this to, to, uh, to matter. Um, the, um, even with the solutions for Asmachta, I should note the, the, the website for the RCA prenup, the prenup.org, has letters on it from various Rabbanim. So it has a letter from Rabbi Weiss overall in support, but he wants to make sure that the sum is based on a reasonable number for support. You can't just you know, pick random large numbers. That doesn't work. Um, and I've seen Reb quoted from an article of his in Benesivas Halacha, but I haven't seen the original article. But I've heard Reb quoted as saying, I've seen Reb quoted as saying that it's still asmachta in that article, even with all of this, because the husband doesn't expect to divorce her. They do this before they get married. They're not, they're not thinking divorce. They wouldn't be getting married if they were thinking divorce. The... Um, but that's one issue, is the Asmachta issue. The other issue is the Get Ma'usa issue. It seems like you are coercing him via financial penalty. If you take a look at source number 20 from the Shulchan Aruch, <coughs> it starts out with a line we are familiar with already, right, about, uh, you know, from Rabbeinu Peretz. He can give a pledge to it, but look at the Ramah. V'hu adinim kiba kinyan legarish, right, like we talked about. Avalim kiba alav knasos im lo yegarish lo mikriones. First, he says, if the guy accepts a financial penalty for failure to divorce, it's not called ones, because talakito b'davarachar, because it was indirect, right? And then he says, though, look at the part I bolded after that, v'yesh machmir in afilu b'kiyai gavna. And some are strict. That Rashba we quoted before is who he's quoting here. He says they don't like this idea of financial penalties. And the Chathila, you should exempt him from the Knas before he gives the get. And then he goes on and says, but the Ebedo, it's okay. The, um, so, the, there are, so what do you do about this? So, no, is this a Lechathila case? Does Lechathila necessarily mean... So, so hang in there. The, um, so there are two grounds for leniency. First, before you get to any other lechatchila b'diavad, one ground for leniency, and this is as brought in the Rambam, is the position that the um, he got into this knas willingly. 
the guy wanted to give the he, he agreed to this on his own before the marriage ever started. This was Rav Maimonur's point, based on the Gemara Gitin Memvav, source number 21. Rabbi Yossi's comment. Rabbi Yossi Be'uda says, Maisenami b'tzida be'echad sh'amar li'ishto kono meini megarshech. A man swore off whatever he swore off with his kono, right? He took a neder, if he would refuse to divorce her. V'girshan, then he divorced her. The rule ordinarily is that if a man divorces his wife as a result of a ned there, we don't allow remarriage. However, in this case, it was permitted. The Chacham allow remarriage. They didn't view this as divorce as a result of ned there. So, Rav Maimonur, in source number 22, in discussing the case of the financial incentive for a get, which we talked about in the beginning of this year, um, I'm seeing the time, and so I'm going to just say it outside, but you can look at it inside as well. The, um, he brought support from that Gemara and Gittin uh, and other proofs as well to argue that if a man willingly entered into it, it's not called Musa. That's number one. Number two, the point we've already mentioned, and the Ramah noted it, is that it's talagita b'davar acher. He made his get contingent on something external. The, um, and this is also of my manure's point in source number 22. The, um, that where is talagita b'davar acher? Towards the end of it, he says, Ein b'zeh ones klal kishigirish, ava b'nishva l'garish doma l'ones shetala gepish v'oso. You swear you're going to divorce? That's an issue. Because there it's direct. The payment, he says, is, uh, is, is indirect. Which is why the agreement, the RCA agreement, removes any verbal link between the payment and the get. It's very interesting. If you look back carefully at the wording, you'll notice it never says, and he is going to make this payment until he gives the bill of divorce. It's while they're living apart. Because you'd want to make clear that you're following this view, that it's actually indirect. However, the Beis Yosef, quotes the Rashba, which we already you know, noted above, but I brought you here in source number 23, the, um, which is the, the Beis Yosef citation of the Rashba. Look at the end. Shuvah. Near Elisha get zema usa upasul kol sheyodin ba'unso. He says, if we know that there was such an ones, He's not, this, this get is not, uh, is not valid. I've seen those who try to read them as not having a machlokas, that the Rashba would actually accept of Maimonur, depending on how the knas was created, that in this case specifically it was created inappropriately, um, but the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah don't think so. They clearly believe this is a machlokas. They're, they're fairly straightforward. Some, in fact, read it even stricter. The Mishnah Yaakov, which I brought you in source number 24, argues even stricter and said that the Maimon would agree with the Rashba in all but the narrowest of cases. The, um, the Mishnah's Yaakov actually takes an even, uh, an even stricter stance on this. He says, He says, Only where this guy was willing in the beginning and continued to be willing all along. Do we, do we count this? But otherwise, you know, where it's just a question of, do we need to ponder him officially? Do we need to exempt him officially before he, uh, before he gives the get? But otherwise, the Mishnah's Yaakov believes the Rashba would still be strict. The, um, the Ramah um, says that, um, that Rav Maimon is, uh, is, is law, right? And he quotes the Ma'arik to support that as well. And then he says, Yesh Mahmirin. Right, that's the Rashba. So the um, so Rav Amar, Rav Shlomo Amar, in his Shama Shlomo in Chelik Vav, it's Tshuva uh, Chaf Siv Beis, says that he thinks, and this goes back to what uh, to what Ezer wanted to say, that the Ramah would be lenient in our case to prevent Aguna. It's like it's a bit the Eved. The, um, the, uh, and then even the Rashba might be lenient because here the agreement to the Knas was made before they got married and it was to prevent obstruction of the uh, of the get the, um, so he thinks that even the Ramah would go along with this but again the Mishkas Yaakov is going to be sitting there on the other side Rav Amar Rav Shlomo Amar Shama Shlomo Chilik Vav Shuvah Chav Siv Beis it's available on the uh, on the Otsar website I didn't want to retype it um, two other notes in favor of not calling it Ma'usa. So some argue that financial payments are never called kafia. That's not what we have in mind when we talk about coercion. The Tzitz Eliezer says this. I brought it for you in source number 25, the last side. 
he says, Ofen hakfia, just what I bolded there. Ofen hakfia hamudubaras leposkim hukfia mamash peshotim. Right? Shotim, not fools. The, uh, with sticks. He says, that's what counts as, uh, as, as coercion. This is not. Go to my second bold. Kfiya derech brera olagari shalashalim mizonos leisha. What we're talking about is a choice. You could divorce and you could just pay. That's your, that's your decision. We're not compelling you to do so. So that's one reason not to call it Musa in addition to the idea that he was willing all along and so forth. The, and then the other is the Chazanish, which we noted above, where the Chazanish read the Rosh, but to say that if he accepts the Kanas properly, it doesn't make it Ones. It's like giving again to avoid Sheer Ksus. It's not like being hit with sticks. So that's your your Ma'usa discussion, right? So your Asmachta discussion we try to get out of by providing as many you know, bells and whistles as we can. Mayaksha, Basin Khashuv, he's doing the Kenyan. And the, uh, and the Asmachta argument you try to avoid by noting that the Ramad does have the view that financial payments are not considered a problem, that it is indeed indirect, that, the, um, that he was willing when he accepted it, and that we're dealing with a Bidiyavid case. So, that, you know, those are things that you string together. There is, I note in the last two sources, an overall discomfort with setting up marriages against a framework of how to end them. <laughs> you know, you're having a conversation with them beforehand of how, how this marriage would end. Uh, Rogadaya Axelrod, in particular, is very sharp in source number 26. He wants to make the argument against the whole prenup concept. He says, that's not really called Kiddushin. If you're getting married with a sense of, here's how I get out of it. He doesn't like that idea. The, um, he's, he's very he's very sharp in his uh, in his opposition. You can find that online if you just Google the phrase. You'll find that online as part of a longer discussion about Kedusha and The um, on the other hand, Ruchaim David Alevi says, "Come on, we have all these other halachos regulating all these issues anyway. It's all in Shulchan Aruch. It's not like we're afraid of a discussion about the laws of divorce and what happens to finances and who gives and how gives and whatever. Like uh, this is halacha on the books. So so no, don't don't tell me that we can't have this conversation." That's his uh, his response. Okay, that's a brief introduction to the issues of uh, prenuptial